Good evening and welcome to our four score speaker series. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome back Dr. Jonathan White to discuss his recently released book, My Day with Abe Lincoln. My name is Phyllis Evans and I'm the Senior Director of Development at the Lincoln Presidential Foundation. Our foundation is the only national foundation focused on increasing and accessing the history, educational programs, exhibits, and sites highlighting the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. We do our work in cooperation and partnership with others locally, nationally, and globally. Our vision is for a world where freedom and democracy flourish, inspired by the life and work of Abraham Lincoln. For more information on how you can support this mission, please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to remind you that we will entertain questions from the audience, so please type them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as possible. And now, please join me in welcoming our Foundation President and CEO, Aaron Carlson Mass. Aaron? Thank you, Phyllis. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our special Lincoln Birthday edition of our Four Score Speaker Series. We're delighted to be joined again by Dr. Jonathan W. White to discuss his newest book, My Day with Abe Lincoln, which was just released earlier this month. It's full of great stories, so this will be a fun conversation for all ages, though it is a book published for young people. And it's a great new book to share with all the young people in your life. For all the teachers, librarians, and family members in the audience, there's also a companion teacher's guide. We'll provide a link to that in the chat. Throughout our conversation tonight, I'm going to weave in some of the classroom discussion questions from the teacher's guide. Why? Because I can't pass up the opportunity to hear John's answers to some of these questions. Dr. White is Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He's author or editor of over a dozen books and more than 100 articles, essays, and reviews about the Civil War. His earlier book, Emancipation, the Union Army and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln, was named a best book of 2014 by Civil War Monitor was a finalist for both the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and the Jefferson Davis Prize, and won the Abraham Lincoln Institute's 2015 Book Prize. Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War was named a best book of 2017 by Civil War Monitor. His 2018 book, Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Dimension of the Civil War, co-authored with Anna Gibson Holloway, was a finalist for the Indie Book Awards, an honorable mention for the John Lyman Book Award. He's a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, serves on the boards of directors of the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Institute and the Abraham Lincoln Association, and is the vice chair of the Lincoln Forum. He also serves on the Ford Theater Advisory Council, the editorial board of the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, and as the editor of the Lincoln Forum Bulletin and Lincoln Lore. In 2019, he won the Outstanding Faculty Award of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, the highest award given to faculty in the Commonwealth. <clears throat> John's three, three other recent books that John has um, published are My Work Among the Freedmen, The Civil War and Reconstruction Letters of Harriet M. Buss, which he co-edited with his student, Lydia Davis, to address you as my friend, African-American Letters to Abraham Lincoln in 2021, A House Built by Slaves, African-American Visitors to the Lincoln White House, released in 2022, and Shipwrecked, A True Civil War Story of Mutinies, Jailbreaks, Blockade Running, and the Slave Trade, published in 2023. We've been pleased to host John on this program to speak about several of those books. The book we're discussing tonight is his latest, My Day with Abe Lincoln, which again came out February 1st and is available now. John, it's great to have you back. Thanks for having me. I think I need to send you a shorter bio for next time. We've used up half our time already. <laughs> Well, you know, when you've published and edited as much as you have, it's hard not to go through all of that. And you've won so many great awards for your work, work too. Oh, thanks. So like your other books, My Day with Abe Lincoln features great storytelling, John. But unlike your other books, this is written specifically for young people. I believe is six to eight is the age range. Yeah, six to nine or ten. Six to nine or ten. Um, and it uses true stories, but they're woven together as part of this fictional account of the main character, Lucy, and her day. What inspired you to write a children's book? So I have, as many people in the audience may know, I have two daughters, and I can actually show them in the children's book here. Let me pull it up. That's right. There's illustrations of them. That's I right. loved that. <laughs> this is Charlotte and Clara. Charlotte is the older one, and Clara will turn eight on February 27th. So it's coming up. Very excited about that birthday. And I've been telling them stories at bedtime for 10 years now. Usually I make up stories about bunnies or mice or talking dogs and bears and things. 
But I also try to weave in some history when I can. And we own a lot of children's books about Lincoln and the Civil War and other aspects of history. And so a number of years ago, I had the idea that I wanted to try to write a story that would be for kids, but about Lincoln. It started with I would do a book or do an article about Lincoln's youth and going to school. And then I kind of expanded it into an idea for a picture book. And then as I was working, I thought, well, there's a lot of books that already do that. So how could I come up with a sort of different take that gives what I like to say is it gives students, their, kids, their vegetables while they think they're getting ice cream. And so what I came up with was this girl goes to she doesn't want to go to school one day. Her name's Lucy. And I'm sure every parent in the audience has experienced this on a Monday morning. And today's Monday. I, I did experience this about 12 hours ago, 13 hours ago, where you know, the kids just don't want to get out of bed and go to school. And so Lucy throws a tantrum and doesn't want to go to school and does something that just magically spend, sends her back in time. And she spends the day with Abraham Lincoln and learns all about him. And what I tell people is all of the stories in the book are true, except for the time travel part. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, as you mentioned, it begins with her, Lucy, not wanting to go to school. She wants to do anything else but go, you know, watch TV, you know, whatever it is. Um, so here's the first teacher guide question I'm going to ask you, though, and I invite anyone from the audience who wants to share their response to this in the chat, too, if you feel comfortable doing so. John, have you ever had a day when you didn't want to go to school? Well, as a professor, I have that a lot, I think. Where <laughs> I wake up and I think, oh, I got so many meetings today or I'm not quite ready for class. You know, it's funny as as a professor, I still have those kind of dreams that I I have an exam to take and I haven't studied or a class to teach and I haven't put my syllabus together. So I wake up worried about having to go into work. I'm sure as a kid, I had days I didn't want to go to school, although that was so long ago, I can't remember any of them. Yeah. Well, so I think maybe, you know, you did your Civil War Dreams book. Maybe there can be a Dreams of Academia or, you know, because I, you know, mine is that I'm registered for a class and it's near the end of the semester and somehow I I didn't know it was on my schedule and I didn't go. And that's, I was one of those people who had, you know, even my 8 a.m. classes in college, I was there. So yep. I don't know what that plays on, but yeah, the whole, there's anxiety for a lot of people around school. That's right. Um, how does how does that experience both as a parent and as a professor shape the way you teach? Because I know enough about your teaching style, John, that you um, you make a point of making it extremely engaging for your students. And certainly I hope our audience always feels like that um, when we host you here for a program. But how does that knowing that it's something that might be vegetables, as you say, to some people, how does that approach how you teach history? I think that storytelling is really important especially for engaging young people and and not only telling a good story that draws them in, but also showing them its importance or its relevance. So I teach at Christopher Newport University. It's a small state school in the Tidewater part of Virginia. We have about 4,500 students. And every fall I teach a freshman class where most of the students are not in my discipline. They're not American studies majors. They're not interested in history. They're from the sciences or communications, all sorts of different fields, but they need to take a class on civic and democratic engagement. And so I teach this class and I go in and I have 99 students on the first day. And on the very first day I walk in and I don't even introduce myself. I put up a slide of Abraham Lincoln's birth cabin, which as people who know the Lincoln story well know, it's not really his birth cabin. But I put up a picture of this this cabin in the temple in Hodgenville, Kentucky. And without even saying anything about the class or the syllabus, I just start talking. And I start to tell the story of Abraham Lincoln's childhood and all these incredible moments. And I bring them up to the point where Lincoln has just lost Ann Rutledge and he had this debacle of a relationship with Mary Owens and he has met Mary Todd. And then I say to them, I've brought you up to this point in his life where he delivers a speech, the Young Men's Lyceum Address, mm. which is a little bit before he meets Mary Todd. But I bring them up to this point and I say, I, I brought you to this point in this life and you're going to read the speech for next class. And if you just read it as a speech, you're going to think, oh, this is just, you know, a dull political speech that some old guy gave 180 years ago. But now you know all the things that were going on in Lincoln's life and the struggles and the emotional 
issues he was dealing with and striving to make a success of himself. And I try to get them to see that he's a human being. And at that mm. point, I put a picture up on the the screen of the Lincoln Memorial. And I say, you know, if you think about him at all, you think about this sort of icon. But now I want you to think about him as a person who went through things in life that aren't so different from what we do. And so that's my approach to teaching. And and I, I find that it's very successful in terms of getting students engaged and getting them interested in something that they didn't know was interesting and also getting them to think differently about someone like Abraham Lincoln. And so I tried to, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the stories that work into my day with Abe Lincoln are some of the stories I tell to my classes. So I was, I tell them in a different way here, but it's the same kind of storytelling I try to do. Nice. So Lucy time travels, as you mentioned, back to 1820s Indiana when the Lincolns lived in Pigeon Creek where she encounters, so she's she's plopped into the middle of this trail and she encounters Sarah and Abraham Lincoln, but she doesn't know they're the Lincolns at this point. And they're on their way to school. And that's the focus of a few chapters, this journey to the school, the experience in the schoolhouse, the trip home um, with the Lincolns to their family's log cabin, which of course leads to more storytelling. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot about the school then and now, but also, about how important learning was to Abraham Lincoln. Education is a major theme of this book. Can you talk about your decision to make that a major overarching theme? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, with the first question about has there ever been a time you haven't want to go to school? I think a lot of kids experience that. I did a I've done a couple of children's programs in the last week or two and I did a program this past weekend with some kids and this one boy I asked a question along those lines this one boy raises his hand I don't like to go to school and then this other girl I don't like to go to school either and you know I think kids just naturally schools work and it's hard and you know there's more fun things you could be doing and so that's a universal experience that most kids can relate to so I wanted Lucy to kind of embody that because my hope was that that would make it relatable for young readers or for parents who read it to their kids, if their kids are maybe kindergarten or aren't quite able to read it yet. And But as Lucy travels back in time and learns just how important education was to Lincoln and how it sort of set him on a path, it then, I think, brings about a change in her way of thinking as well. And I don't want to spoil it, or we'll probably get to it at the end, well, yeah. but she's a different person at the end of the story <laughs> than she is at the beginning. For sure. And I think, I, I like that you demonstrate through the stories that Lincoln loved learning and saw it as essential to making something of his life and, and doing something different with his life than, um, you know, and improving his condition in life. Whenever I think of Lincoln's views of education, one of the speeches that comes to mind is his address for, at the Wisconsin State Fair in 1859. And it's a speech on free labor, um, but also he talks about the companion to free labor being universal education. That idea is not stated explicitly anywhere in your book, but the reader is introduced to that in subtle ways that I thought were very effective, such as when Lucy learns that there's a fee that she would have to pay if she were attending um Abe and Sarah's school and the teacher allows her to you know attend the first one for free if you will yeah. as a trial run um but that's surprising to her because she's used to free public education um and it catches her off guard and then when Abraham Lincoln she makes a reference to her iPad and he thinks it's eye patch that she's saying or she's talking right. about her tablet time and he says oh we have tablet time too but he's holding up a slate um it's just classic I loved that one but the teacher, um, there, there is a risk in doing that of it turning into a back in my day right. type story, um, you know, the whole five miles uphill in the snow each ways that, that kids can kind of tune out. But you were able to do it, you were able to express all of that and tell those stories in a way that it was much more about her discovering those differences as just that differences without a value judgment necessarily of it yeah. being better or worse. And then appreciating those differences later, internalizing them and changing how she was acting um, because she experienced it in a way that was transformative for her. So was that, how intentional did you have to be about that to keep it from being that sort of back in my day, or this is how, you know, 
you, this is a privilege. You don't know how good you have it. Type of story. Yeah. I, it's, I hadn't really thought about it. It's a really interesting observation. I, I wanted it to be that there was some discovery on both of their parts. So yeah. she's learning about them. But then when she says things that come out of her time, Sarah and Abe are really surprised, like with the iPads where, yeah. you know, they, or, you know, she says computers and they don't know what those are. And she just is talking like a 10 year old or an eight year old. And so those words just naturally come out of her mouth, even though they don't fit in that time. So that might be how I, was able to pull it off was just by having them sort of learn from each other in the process. And the hope was that some of those scenes would be funny for kids when they read about, you know, the, I, you know, she, they talk, she mentions an iPad reading on an iPad and Abe says, I couldn't read with an iPad, Sean. Like, yeah, my yeah. Covered. like my hope was kids will kind of laugh at that. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I mean, I laughed at it, so I don't know what that means, but I thought it worked pretty well. Um, I also noticed in the teacher guide, you listed shaking hands as a major theme. Mm -hmm. um, and you quote another one of your books that we've had you speak about here, A House Built by Slaves, in which you wrote, quote, in almost every instance, he, meaning Lincoln, appears to have initiated the human contact. Shaking hands for Lincoln could be an understandably tiresome chore. Um, when he shook hands, one observer noted he does it with a hearty will in which his entire, entire body joins. Um, What's the significance of handshaking? Shaking it comes up in the context of learning manners through yeah. school as well. Um, but I have to admit, after having read the book and then looking at the teacher guide, it didn't jump out to me as a main theme. So why call it out as a main theme in the teacher guide? I think that one was more subtle. She also shakes Thomas Lincoln's hand yep. when when they meet at the cabin. So there's a few moments. So this was a theme that I didn't expect when I wrote A House Built by Slaves. Yeah. So for those who haven't read it, it's a history of Black visitors to the Lincoln White House. And every Black person who came to the White House who met Lincoln, who left an account, talked about how Lincoln shook their hand. Mm -hmm. Men and women, rich and poor, born free, born enslaved, didn't matter. Lincoln shook their hands. And as I read account after account after account, I was just floored by this because at the same time I would read accounts of some of these same black visitors who met white abolitionists who refused to shake their hands and so I thought there's something really important about Lincoln shaking hands and so that became a big theme in a house built by slaves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as I was doing the research on this book I found that Lincoln's teacher Andrew Crawford this is in Herndon's informants he would he would have his students go around the room and practice greeting each other and shaking their hands. And that's something I've spoken with so many teachers and parents about that, you know, they say kids need to learn this sort of thing or kids aren't learning it. And there's been so many times where I've met a, you know, a high school student and I go to shake their hand and I get like the floppy fish. Oh, you know? yeah. like they, they've just never learned how to do it. And Lincoln's teacher in Spencer County, Indiana, apparently made it a point to teach his students those manners. And so as I was writing the book and I was thinking about, okay, Lucy is coming into this classroom, what would Andrew Crawford have done? Well, he might have did what we know he made his students do. So I have her go around, shake hands. And I wanted that sort of manner to teaching to be present in the book, but then it, it's also been something that's been in my mind for a few years because of what I know about Lincoln later in life. And it may be that he learned that from Andrew Crawford. Yeah. Interesting. I like that. Um, so you mentioned that there are the things that Lucy does um, or talks about that are foreign to Abe and Sarah. And I love that Sally uh, Lincoln, his their stepmother actually says, you know, something about, I don't know if she's from Philadelphia or New York, yeah. you know, she, she must be from the Northeast because of her weird ways. And I, I should so. say I'm a Philadelphian. So if any, yeah. no one can take offense to that because I, uh, I was thinking about my, my hometown. Yeah, no, I like that you included your own hometown in there actually. Um, but can you hold up the cover of the book again so that people yeah. can get a look at it? So she, Lucy, as you could, she wear, she's wearing a top hat, which is actually a magician's hat that's central there to the go. story. This polka dot scarf, rainbow tights, which you probably can't see here, have a hole in the left knee, no shoes, 
So she she's dressed pretty oddly to say. And a the pink least. shirt with a unicorn. And a pink shirt with a unicorn, yes. So um, but I like the exchange that this brings in about how, you know, she's dressed kind of funny, right? Yeah. Um, and the story about Abraham Lincoln in the sunbonnet and being embarrassed on the first day of right. school um comes up. And there that relates to a teacher guide question. So here's the next one. Have you ever been embarrassed at school like Abe Lincoln? John. Oh goodness. Again, you're you're asking me to go way back, way back <laughs> in my memory. It's been a long time since I was in elementary school. I can remember one time getting in trouble at school when I was in 11th grade. I forget what I did to merit punishment, but I, I ended up getting a punishment that was meted out in a way that I had to clean up um, really soggy leaves in a in a way that it was done in front of the entire, I was a senior and it was in, in front of the entire freshman and sophomore classes during the, oh so they all saw me having to do this. And I, I do remember being very embarrassed and very upset. Now that I'm older, I realized whatever I had done, I'm sure I deserve some sort of <laughs> punishment, but at the time I, I, uh, I didn't think so. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I should the point out for the, for the audience, she dresses like this, because she hopes that maybe if she just dresses in the silliest outfit possible, that they won't let her go to school. And my original mechanism for having her travel back in time was I was going to have her fall down the stairs, like slip in these tights and fall down. And I sent it to Alan Gelzo and he said, you can't do that because then kids are going to probably try to like fall down the stairs to travel back in time. And I have to give credit to one of my colleagues, Frank Garman, who teaches at CNU. He said, why don't you use a hat? And I thought that's a great idea. That's and brilliant. So the hat then becomes this mission of hers to eventually give it to Lincoln. And I love that. Well, and in addition, so, I mean, in, in the story, it's supposed to be her younger brother's hat from a new magician kit that he got. Right but it has a hidden pocket in it for the rabbit. Yep. And then that comes into play later. I'm sure everyone in our audience has heard the story of how Abraham Lincoln used to stick his papers in the lining of his hat. And so this hidden pocket for the rabbit becomes the pocket or the idea for Lincoln to stick his papers in later. So I like how you linked those things together in the story. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the stories that make it into this book um, are ones from Lincoln's boyhood years that that many people would recognize, and many of them reveal something about Lincoln's character that I think is relatable to young people. For example, you include the classic and upsetting story, but classic story of Lincoln's schoolmates harming a turtle and him intervening, and you know, and and there's discussion in the book about Lincoln, and you know caring about animal welfare really deeply. And I think that that's something that your readers will relate to, whether it's through school or visiting zoos. This idea of needing to be kind to all living things is something that comes up regularly, I think, in early childhood education. So how much did your own children's experiences and interests factor into which stories you chose to include in book? In terms of Charlotte and Clara? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So they they had a very real role in terms of writing the book with me. And in fact, I made it something of a job for them. And I even said to them, when the book is published, I'm going to you're each going to get paid one hundred dollars for this. And so they were like very motivated to help. And February 1st, they've made more money off this book than I have, I should say. <laughs> um, a lot of these stories are ones that they've encountered where we, you know, either I've been telling them stories or they do come up in some other children's books. And, you know, my kids love animals. We don't have any pets. They very badly want pets. And I've I've resisted so far. Um, so, you know, they, they love animals, though. And I think that having those stories come out um, are ones that resonated with them. And then some of them are harder involving animals. You know, the story of the horse that kicks Abraham Lincoln yes. in the head and almost kills him. And we know that's a true story. There are accounts, I believe, that come down through Herndon, but then also in 1860, Lincoln writes this autobiographical sketch where in third person, he says that he was almost killed for a time. And so um, I wanted to sort of give a sense of Lincoln, you know, when you lived in the frontier or in the wilderness and, you know, backwoods Indiana in the 1820s, 
you were surrounded by wild animals. And Lincoln mm-hmm. talked about that, you know, when they first moved to Spencer County, that it was, a, he called it a wild region. And so I wanted to capture some of that, but then also some of the other aspects of his interaction with animals. And that, as you said, I mean, he really cared about living beings, whether they're animals or people. And that comes out in his childhood. And I think sometimes people make light of those stories, maybe because there's so many of them and you sometimes wonder, okay, could they all be true? And yet there are so there are so many of them coming from so many different sources of people remembering how much Lincoln cared about animals, whether, and this one's not in the book, but there's a story about, you know, him going to give a speech one day and he sees a pig stuck in a mud hole and he's wearing his new suit and he gets down and pulls the pig out. There's another story that I believe is true where he's riding with Joshua Speed and he sees a bird that's fallen and he, you know, gets down and climbs a tree and puts it back in its nest. Like there's enough of these stories that I think it's it's reliable that Lincoln did care about animals. And as, as late as City Point, Virginia in 1864 or 65, he's visiting Grant at the field and sees these cats and asks a colonel or an officer to take care of them. So from early life all the way to the end of his life, he really cared about animals. And, and you know, as you said, that's something that I think kids can resonate with. And yeah. I wanted to make it a good theme. Yeah. And, and actually, that reminds me of one of the funnier stories we had at President Lincoln's Cottage that we came across when all the research was happening before we opened that site of um, not only President Lincoln, but Secretary of War Edwin Stanton climbing up a tree to free a couple of peacocks that had gotten caught up there because they had these little strings and weights so that they couldn't just fly away and the strings got tangled. So the two of them climbed up into the tree to free these peacocks. So there's, there's another animal welfare story. That's a sight to think about Stanton like that. Especially with that beard. Yeah. Um, Well, so you mentioned this and and I did want to ask, because you fit so many wonderful stories into this book. Were there any stories you wanted to include um, that you had to leave out? Yeah. There are definitely it whenever you finish a book, you always think about things that you wish you had included. Um, you know, I had some in mind the other day, and i'm I'm actually writing a second book that'll be set in the White House that I kind of tease at, I think in in here. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what I can work into into that one. Um, gosh, nothing. I know there were some, and I'm just t- drawing a total blank on it. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll bring it back up later. Sounds good. Well, and there are also a couple of instances of a story within a story occurring in the book, which I really liked. One is when Lucy goes home with Abe and Sarah after school. She's having dinner with his family. Squirrel is on the menu, and she she doesn't know how she feels about that, but she it makes a point of using her best manners and you know not appearing to be shocked and and going with the flow on that. Um, And then they sit around a fire outside and hear Thomas Lincoln tell the dramatic story of how his father, Captain Abraham Lincoln, was killed and how he himself narrowly escaped um, or survived the incident. Can you tell us about your decision to include that story where you have Thomas Lincoln recounting a story? Um, why Why was it important to include some family stories like that? Yeah, that's a great question. This one, I had some people really encourage me to not include it really okay the in the 1780s the lincoln family lincoln's dad is six or eight years old his father's clearing a farm gets his the father lincoln's grandfather captain abraham lincoln gets shot and killed by a shawnee warrior and thomas lincoln could have been killed or kidnapped in that moment and he gets saved when his older brother mordecai shoots and kills the native american and so it's it's a story that has a lot to it and that also um, could be read in a lot of different ways in our modern context in the 21st century. And so I had some people encourage me to not include it in this book for kids. And I decided to include it for a couple of reasons. The one is we know that Abraham Lincoln heard this story a lot from his dad mm-hmm. when he was a kid. I mean, Thomas Lincoln told this story. And I wanted to capture that side of Thomas Lincoln because Thomas Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln had a very difficult relationship. And 
very clearly Abraham Lincoln did not want to be like his father in a lot of ways. And also um, Abraham Lincoln, you know, when his father was dying, wrote a letter where he said, yeah, it'd be better if I didn't go see to a stepbrother. He said, it'd be better if I didn't go see my father right now. It'd be more painful for all of us. And he chose not to see his dad before his dad died. And that's a pretty incredible thing. So on the one hand, like we know about the difficulties between Thomas and Abraham Lincoln. But I also think that it it's possible that Lincoln may have gotten some of his storytelling ability from his father. If if Thomas told this story and other stories and jokes in a compelling way and Abraham Lincoln picked up some of that from um from his dad, I, I thought that was an important strain to kind of bring into this kid's book and show that side of of Thomas Lincoln's character. And then in the in the teacher guide, what I do is I talk a little bit about what happened in Lincoln's life later. Mm -hmm. So you might suspect that if Lincoln grew up with this story, he would have great bitterness towards Native Americans. And to be sure, his record on Native Americans is not spotless. But during the Black Hawk War, Lincoln was fighting against Native Americans, although Lincoln only saw, you know, experienced bloodshed from mosquitoes, as yeah. Peter said. <laughs> His classic story on that. Yeah. That's right. But there was one point where an elderly Native American man came into the camp and Lincoln's comrades wanted to beat him up or kill him and Lincoln stopped them. And then during the Civil War, there's a lot that happens. And so in the curriculum guide, I, I kind of talk about very briefly and concisely what happened in Minnesota in 1862 and the very controversial decisions that Lincoln made. And so I think that being able to see this sort of family story connecting the Lincolns to Native Americans is illuminating when thinking about Lincoln's later life. So I, I for all those reasons, I wanted to include it. And I, I tried to do it in the most tactful way that I could and also make it age appropriate for young readers. Um, but for the teacher or the parent who wants to be able to talk about it with their kids and with their students, then, you know, you can get the teacher guide and it'll give you the background to the story and then how it portends Lincoln's future. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's not a main point of the story, but at the end you have Lucy saying, you should really write that down. That's a page turner. And it, it comes out that Lincoln, that Thomas Lincoln is illiterate and can't, read or write yeah um and so it, it i found that to be an interesting and subtle way of reinforcing just the value of education in general yeah too. um but that he was still able to tell the story that had them all you know mesmerized and hanging on his every word well. yeah yeah um one of the other instances is back in the present when you have lucy checking out a book from the library on abraham lincoln and she's reading it aloud to herself so that we the reader are reading what she's reading <laughs> Right. And my favorite part there is when you brought something from earlier in the story back, which was Lincoln's misspelling of the word wizard. Yeah. So, so she's reading about him calling himself education deficient and the low bar of education and educators from his perspective at when where he was growing up on the frontier. And that famous quote, if a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. Yeah. Um, but you worked in the W-I-Z-Z-A-R-D spelling earlier when the schoolhouse ends the day with a spelling bee. Um, what were you hoping the readers got from these stories of Abraham Lincoln struggling with spelling or him feeling like he was education deficient? And also just how did you think about tying those two things together? Because I loved the second I saw wizard in the spelling bee, it immediately made me think of that. I was so happy to see it come in. Oh, again cool. In the story. Yeah. So I my hope again, like in the same way that when I teach my first day of class and I tell students about Lincoln's love life and Lincoln's struggles and the times Lincoln almost died, my hope is to make him relatable so mm -hmm. that he's not just an icon. So I I tell many of your viewers probably know the story of the spelling bee where Anna Roby is given the word defied and she keeps spelling it D-E-F-Y-E-D. -E -E and we know this story because of Herndon's informants. And she later told the story. And so she keeps getting it wrong until she looks at the window and there's Abraham Lincoln pointing at his eye. And she figures out it's D-E-F-I-E-D. -E -E and I've actually, I've been doing a lot of, I've done a couple kids events and I have a bunch 
coming up. And what I do at each one is I open up by asking students to spell the words that are in the book. They don't know why, but I just say, can I get a volunteer to spell very or defied or wizard and a few others? And then I, I use that as a segue to kind of talk about that Lincoln struggled with spelling. And so my hope was that readers, young readers will see you know, Lincoln was a real person who struggled with things, and he struggled with spelling the word very his whole life. I mean, if you go into the collected works of Abraham Lincoln online and search for V-E-R-R-Y, you'll find almost 40 times that he misspelled it. Or he misspelled, I think, the word inauguration or inaugural when he was writing his inaugural address. I mean, here's the guy about to become president, and he doesn't even know how to spell that. And so in this autobiographical sketch from 59 or 60 where he spells wizard wrong i knew i wanted to include the spelling bee story and all we know about it is that anna roby couldn't spell defied and i thought well i want to have abe in this and and i thought he couldn't spell wizard and yet he thought of teachers as wizards and so <laughs> i thought it would just be a really fun way to kind of pull these things together and have that through line so that it comes up early and then lucy realizes at the end oh wow he couldn't spell that no wonder yeah well there are also um at least two examples in the book of you sharing something with the reader that the reader can use in their own lives very directly and for ex one example is abraham lincoln sharing how reading aloud helps him because he's engaging two senses. Lucy then does this later in the book herself and reading aloud has many developmental and reading comprehension benefits we know that's studied today. Um, reading aloud to other people, so both being a child and hearing books reading aloud and then also doing it for oneself. Tell us about Lincoln's two senses approach to reading and why you why you chose to include that specifically. It's funny, it's something that I do, especially when I'm reading my own work. I always read it aloud. And I will often have students email me and they'll say, I've got this paper. Can you, can I send you a draft and you give me feedback on it? And I always say, here's my policy. You can come into my office and I will print it out and I will read it aloud to the two of us and we can talk about it. And it's so interesting when you hear things you see things that you didn't see before. And so I'll have a student sitting across the table from me and I'm reading their paper out loud and marking it up as we go. And I can see them cringing because they're like, did I really write that? It doesn't say what I thought it did. So Lincoln grew up going to what were called blab schools. And these were one room schoolhouses where everyone was in a single room from, you know, five to 18. And they're they're doing their lessons out loud and it had to be horribly distracting. And at some point he just developed this skill of when he was reading, he would read out loud. And as you said, he, he said that way he got it by two senses, his eyes and his ears. And I do that. And I, I found it to be a really helpful thing. And so Lucy learns that as well. She then does it at the end of the book in the library and gets shushed for it when she starts giggling at something. But I, I commend it to everyone. I encourage my kids to do it. And as long as you're not, you know, on an airplane where you're going to upset your seatmate. But right. yeah. if you're at home, it's a great way to read. Absolutely. And um, I think I mentioned earlier that in the book, you have Lucy checking out a book from the library on Abraham Lincoln. And this is a hat tip to any of the librarians in the audience, too. When Lucy asks for a book on Lincoln, the librarian doesn't just go find it for her. He teaches her how to find books. So in the book, you go through the process of searching in the catalog, writing down the catalog numbers, going to the stacks and finding it. This all happens very quickly, of course. It's not, you, yeah. you know, you don't belabor it, but you you make the point of explaining how to do that. Um, and I also loved that in the book, you noted that Lucy was so eager to find a book on Lincoln that she wasn't even annoyed with a librarian <laughs> for trying to teach her how to find it herself instead of just giving it to her. You can tell and, I have kids. Right. So what, tell us about your decision to include that process in the story. It's I empowering. Wanted, yeah, it is. I wanted her to be a different person. And it, the book's only 96 pages and there's 60 images. So, I mean, the book itself is 7,000 words. It's the length of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. So it's not long. But I still, even in that short period, I wanted there to be a transformation from this kid who doesn't want to go to school 
who has such a transformative experience of meeting Abraham Lincoln that when she comes back, she appreciates the things that he appreciated. So she appreciates reading and learning because she sees now what it did for him. And so, um, you know, there are so many times where I get asked to do something, whether it's by my kids or by a student or whoever. And I used to be of a mind of it's just easier for me to do it myself. But then at some point I realized I'm I'm doing them a disservice if I always just do it for them. And so I wanted and I remember having teachers when I was younger who would teach us certain skills that, you know, maybe we didn't want to learn at the time. But learning, you know, I it's interesting. I did a kids event this weekend and this fifth grade girl came up to me and she was so she was so excited to come to my event. And she had this report she wrote for her class about Abraham Lincoln. And I was really impressed. It was very well done. I read it and I, but I asked her, I said, how did you do your research? And she said, I Googled it. And um, my daughter who is in fifth grade had a science report due about a month ago. And we made her go to Christopher Newport's library and we made her go through the stacks and maybe that's old fashioned. I don't know, but I, I wanted her to see. So I showed her the online catalog and then we found where the books were and we went there and um, I don't know, maybe I'm a Luddite, but I, I I think there are still things. Abraham Lincoln is alleged to have said the things that I want to know are in books. He didn't say the things I want to know are on Google. And a lot is on Google, but there still is something to be found in books. So I hope that kids can, even in, in reading this, can maybe think, oh, yeah, I want to see what's in my school library. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, some of it has to do with spatial awareness and different ways that things are organized. Mm -hmm. So as much as it can be very convenient to have those resources available online and, and you can go down a rabbit hole and click multiple links and find things, stumble across things you didn't think you would, having that experience in the library is different and it's more physical experience. And you mm -hmm. have Lucy experience that in the book where she goes and she had no idea how many history books there were in her library because right. you're going to find one book and then all of a sudden you see everything that's next to it on that same shelf. Um, and, and as a historian, I mean, I have memories of being in college at Penn State and you would go into Petit and Paterno Library and you would go, you knew the one you were looking for. And then when you see everything else on the shelf and all of a sudden you're walking out with a bundle of books, like, that was the joy. That is the joy for me of research where you go looking for one thing and you find something else. So I wanted to, Absolutely. I hadn't thought about it like that in that context, but something I wanted to convey for her. Well, it definitely works. And um, at the beginning of the story, Lucy is very loath to go to school. And when she's back from the past, she rushes out the door to get to school. Um, she's not really explaining exactly what happened to her family. She comes back and screams, you know, yeah. um, because of where she thinks she's still trapped in a in a storm. When she gets to school, prior to going to the library, uh, she tells her teacher that rather than starting the day with tablet time, she wants to go check out a book. And there's this sort of like shock moment that happens in the book. Like no one's really like, really? Um, is this art imitating life? Do you have... A personal experience like that where either one of your own children or one of your students sort of says you know what I want to do it this other way um I want to I want to I want to pick up a book I want to you know I think it was just something that I've I created in the moment but I I certainly my girls are both readers and I've had some students who have just been so intellectually curious that they we for several years we have taken students to Washington, D.C. for about a week in the summer, and the Center for American Studies at Christopher Newport pays the students' way, so we put them up in hotels and get their dinners and transportation and everything, and we take them to the National Archives and to the Library of Congress, and I teach them how to do research, and for students, when they, when they have that experience, it's just eye-opening, as it was for me 20 some years ago to do that for the first time. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a very real thing. I think people can experience. They just sometimes need to have someone show them how they can have that opportunity. Yeah, I would say the same was definitely true for me. And I also having that experience at archaeological sites mm. and in museums, the same kind of experience where it's, again, it's, it's more of an immersive experience that you're right. having versus what you can 
um, just looking things up online. <clears throat> Last question before we turn to audience Q&A and then we'll circle back to talk about your next project towards sure. the end. Um, you asked the reader and in class discussion um, in the teacher guide, how Abraham Lincoln changed Lucy's life. So I wanted to ask you, how has studying Abraham Lincoln and by extension, countless people who influenced him and whose lives were influenced by him changed your life? It's a great question. You know, I've, I've grown to have such an appreciation for Lincoln and today's his birthday. So maybe this is a fitting time to kind of talk about this sort of thing. I've written about a lot of different aspects of Lincoln's life. I'll never write a biography of Lincoln. I don't think. I, I've never had any interest in doing that. There are so many, and there are a lot of good ones out there. But in the different books I've written, they've each touched on a different aspect of his story. So I've written about, I wrote this book, Midnight in America, What Lincoln Dreamt About. And in researching that, thinking about how late he was up at night working. There's a quote attributed to Lincoln where he said, and I use this at the beginning of the book, where he said something like, when people are asleep, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I've done books on Lincoln and civil liberties and Lincoln's reelection and Lincoln and emancipation and Lincoln and African-Americans and all these different Lincoln topics. And the thing that has really impressed itself upon me is, is today we are so quick to judge Lincoln and people are so quick to criticize him. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do this? And yet the, the study I've done of Lincoln has caused me to realize like this guy was juggling an extraordinary amount of things at one time. I mean, he is managing a war with these generals like George McClellan who won't do what they're supposed to and think they're better than him. He is dealing with hundreds of pardon cases, mm. like pardon cases that would make us weep and wives and mothers and children coming in to or writing to him saying, you know, don't shoot my dad or pardon my husband. He's got office hours like a college professor where anyone who wants to can wait in line and go in and talk to him about anything they want. And so how many people came in in April of 1861 saying, you know, I gave a speech in this podunk town in the middle of nowhere. And by the way, my speech got you elected president. So can you make me postmaster of my podunk town? Like he's he's got all these congressmen who are pushing him in different ways. He's got the radicals who are undermining him. He's got the Democrats who hate him. Like he's got all these things going on. And yet somehow he was able to successfully wage the war, save the Union, issue an Emancipation Proclamation, push through a 13th Amendment, give us a national banking system that we still have today, give us the Homestead Act and the Land Grant Acts that give us so many of the colleges and universities we have today. I mean, like all of the things he accomplished with all of these pressures it's given me such an extraordinary appreciation for him. And we can nitpick about why didn't he do this or that when we think he should it when we Monday morning quarterback. And yet he accomplished what he did in real time. And, and he did it with an authenticity that I think very few people have, let alone very few politicians have. I mean, when I read, when I was writing a house built by slaves and I encountered these stories of Lincoln encountering homeless people in Washington, D.C., and yet shaking their hands, giving them a check for $5, offering them food. I mean, that's extraordinary. And so, you know, when we see Lincoln in the second inaugural saying, with malice toward none, with charity for all, I mean, he is a guy who lived it. And, you know, I... All these years later, I think he's still such a real model. And, and those parts of his character, the hard work and the compassion and the looking people in the eye and treating them with respect, they were there when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they grew and developed as he grew and developed, and they were there with him till the last day of his life. And so I suppose 
in a lot of ways, he's the greatest American and and a really wonderful model for people. So I, you know, in the Lincoln fraternity or community, like I try to be like Lincoln and um, as best I can and, you know, always treat people with respect and so forth. And he's a he's an incredible model for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so our first question comes from Melvin, and he asks if there will be an animated series about Abraham Lincoln. I hope so. And Melvin, if you know anyone in Hollywood, please uh, please put me in touch with them. I I think it could be a really fun. I, I'm envisioning three books. Um, we got to see how the first book does, and then if it does well, then hopefully they'll do book two. Book two, I've already written. It's just a matter of I've got to do some work on it. But in book two, she goes to the White House in August of 1861, and I won't spoil how it happens, but she she winds up in a cabinet meeting, and she instantly knows it's Lincoln. And then he looks at her and he knows he's seen her before, but he can't quite put his finger on it because she's only aged six months and he's aged 40 years. And then she goes through the day kind of seeing what he does, but then playing with Willie and Tad. So I think that could be a really fun um, animated thing too. So I'm hoping I can get enough out of it and then I would love to turn it into a series. Fantastic. Series. So um, second question comes from Barbara and she asks, what do you consider a good book to read regarding the young Abraham Lincoln? Besides this one? Um, yeah, and I think she's talking about like an adult book. Like a more, oh, a more a, a adult book. So- Barbara, uh, if I have that wrong, submit another question, but I think, yeah. So, I mean, you could take it as a two-parter in addition to to plugging your book, which is- a very fun read. I have to say, it's been a while since I've read a book that's meant for a six to nine year old audience, yeah. but I thought it was really enjoyable and I could see reading that book aloud. And it certainly covers his, his childhood in Indiana or a lot of the stories from that time. But um, yeah. if someone was looking for a book intended for adults on Lincoln's childhood, what would you recommend? If you're looking for something on Lincoln's childhood, I mean, there are a lot of really good biographies. So Ron White's biography, A. Lincoln, a lot of the research I did on this was actually while I, I edited Michael Burlingame's two volume massive biography of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, A Life Down into a single volume that came out last October. And so as I was editing that, I was kind of plucking things out and thinking, OK, this is going to be really good for my kids book. So like the story about Abraham Lincoln going to school the first day of school in a sunbonnet and then the kids teasing him that came out of Burlingame's biography. So if you want an encyclopedic type of look at Lincoln's early life, I would look at Burlingame's massive two volume biography, something on Lincoln's early adulthood that I very highly recommend is honors voice by Doug Wilson, which is just an extraordinary analysis of Lincoln's kind of coming of age into adulthood and how that pointed forward to his later greatness. So those would be three that come to mind off the top of my head. Great. Um, the third question comes from John who notes, my understanding is that his total education amounted to roughly one year of formal schooling. Does your book touch on that at all? It does. Yeah. So that comes out in the end when Lucy reads about Lincoln's life and what's really funny is in 1858, Lincoln did a, was it 58? I, I forget when it was, but Lincoln did a something where he had to describe his education and he just used one word. He just wrote defective. And so, you know, he less than one year of formal schooling. And there's a very famous story. I forget if I, I think I maybe put it in the teacher's guide um, during the Lincoln Douglas debates in 1858, he did a, they did something in Knox College and, you know, this, the way the stage was set up and the crowd was there, he had to go out a window to get onto the stage. And he said something like, I've finally been through college. Like that was, he didn't have a real education. <laughs> um, so Francie asked if you're going to write another children's book with more stories by Abraham Lincoln and or other members of his family um, and notes that she's looking forward to reading this one. You mentioned that the second one that you, you might try to write three, the second one would be about um, her being at the White House. Have you already thought about what the third book might be? I have. Um, 
although it's it's changing a little bit in my mind uh, the original idea there's a very famous photograph of teddy roosevelt in april of 1865 sitting in his grandfather's window with probably one of his sisters next to him watching the lincoln funeral procession go by and so i've toyed with the idea of having her meet a young teddy roosevelt during that moment and that she would learn about roosevelt and his future as a great conservationist but then she would also learn about what lincoln meant to americans at the end like right after he died so i'm toying with that idea i honestly don't know a ton about roosevelt so i might not set it in new york i might set it in philadelphia and i think i can do it because that's where i grew up i i think i can do it in a way that won't be depressing even though it would be about the lincoln funeral but there's actually a really wonderful moving children's picture book called i think it's called abraham lincoln comes home and it's about the lincoln funeral train and a, a dad who takes his son to watch it go by on the prairies as the train is chugging by and it's really powerful so i think even i think kids can can read a read about that and learn from it if it's done well and so that's what i'm thinking about for the third book in the series yeah, I appreciated that in the first book, you didn't shy away from loss um, and and harm and traumatic events like Lincoln being kicked in the head by a horse. Yeah. Um, but also the the loss that he experienced and then it touches on his mother's death. I mean, that is an experience that many young people go through is the loss of a loved one. Um, and, you know, so I think shying away from it because we think children can't handle it is the wrong way to go. But yeah. doing it in a way that's appropriate um, for that age is is really smart. Bob, um, so for question number five, Bob says, not a question, but want to say thanks for the program. I've pre-ordered the book as soon as I knew about it, but Amazon said it would be delayed. It just arrived. Um, oh. So this we were talking about this before the program began. It was originally supposed to be published in April. Um, but they pushed up the publication of it to February 1st so that it could be available for Lincoln's birthday. So um, and thank you, Bob, for ordering it. Question number six, um, Dr. J would like to know um, when Lincoln was being raised by his second mother, his stepmother, Sally, how did she clean a house, keep two families together and still appreciate Lincoln's curiosity? <laughs> It's a great question. You know, she had been living in Kentucky and when she married Thomas Lincoln and then got to Indiana with her three kids, she got there and the house was in squalor and they had no glass in the windows and no wood on the floors. And she said to Thomas and the boys, you're going to make this a nice place to live. And so they did. And one of the incredible aspects of that story is just how close she and Abraham Lincoln became that she later said, you know, she had her own son, John D. Johnston, who was really a loafer. And she later said that Abraham Lincoln was the best boy she ever saw or ever expect to see. And and Lincoln called her mama. And like they I think a big part of it is that they grew to really love each other. And, you know, they had this blended family where I'm sure there was tension between the kids. You know, you have all these people kind of tucked into a small cabin and yet a real, very real love grew between Lincoln and his stepmother. And I try to bring some of that out in the book. It definitely comes through. Um, so John asks, J-O-H-N, John asks, yeah. um, which of your books that you've written, John, is your favorite for helping folks to understand and know Lincoln better? If you had to pick one of your books. I'd probably pick A House Built by Slaves in in part because I think it's the most relevant book to our time when we think about our politics and our race and I didn't, our, our race issues. And I didn't write about it with wanting to speak to those issues. And I just wrote what I found in the sources. But I think it's probably the most relevant. And it also captures Lincoln's character in a way that I think is important. Absolutely. Um, Carol shares that she's ordered your book to read to her seven-year-old granddaughter. Thank, oh, thank you, Carol. You. <laughs> and she said the discussion guide's really helpful. Um, she appreciates you writing about her favorite president. Autumn would like to be reminded, what was the third adult Lincoln book you recommended? I think that was the Honors Voice one by Honors Wilson. Voice by Douglas Wilson. 
It that's an older book. I think it came out in 1999 or 98. But Excellent. it's still a good one. Right. Um, and Bob Willard noted that your summary of the importance of Lincoln should be transcribed and published. So there you go. Maybe that's an article. <laughs> um, so we're we're near our time, but we do have a special and fun treat for you all. Um, I was when we were talking about John's next project, he's mentioned some of his books, but he's also started this great Lego project about episodes from Lincoln's life. So he's going to share his screen to share this with you. Um, it's pretty fun. Let's take a look. Here we go. So John has created all of these himself. Yeah. With my kids. With his kids. <clears throat> so I'm creating a Abraham Lincoln biography in Lego. And this is kind of the cover page. If anyone's interested, you can either find it on civil uh, on Twitter at that handle there, Civil War John, J-O-N, or on Facebook at Civil War Treason, which I got from one of my older books. But I'm, I'll just very quickly show some of these. Here's Abraham Lincoln as a baby being born with Nancy and Thomas. There's a very famous story that I tell in My Day with Abe Lincoln about him feeding a War of 1812 soldier, a fish that he had caught. There's a famous story about Lincoln uh, falling in a creek and his friend Austin Gallagher pulling him out. I've got Lincoln and the, the Lincolns living in a half-faced camp when they first moved to Indiana. Here you've got the boys who are putting the hot coals onto turtles' backs, and you got Lincoln there. He's actually holding a Harry Potter wand as he's yelling at them to, to stop, you know, torturing the turtles. And um, I'll just show one or two more. Here's them, uh, him and his dad burying Nancy. And then since you mentioned the the crowded house, this is the the blended family all in one cabin. I've got. Each one of the children represented, I've got cousin Dennis Hanks, and then there's Thomas in the background thinking, how are we all going to fit? So um, I'm gradually posting these on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter. And so if you're interested, uh, maybe I should put into the chat what the the handles are just so that um, anyone- That'd who be great. Please do. And John, what a fun project and a great way to use a different medium to share some of the stories of Abraham Lincoln. So thank you for doing that. Phyllis, back to you. All right. Yes. Thank you, John, so much. This has been such a great evening. And, and I loved hearing all the exclusive insights on your first children's book, My Day with Abe Lincoln. And I look forward to the next one. If you haven't already made plans to join us this Friday for the grand opening of our new Lincoln Springfield exhibit, then visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org and res register today. Our foundation is proud to have created this exhibit with our partners at Lincoln's Home, thanks to the generous support from the M.G. Nelson Family Foundation. You can also visit our website for information on two great upcoming Lincoln Forum programs streaming live on C-SPAN. The dates for these programs are February 17th with Ronald White and Kate Masser, and you can catch Aaron and Dr. Jonathan White together again on February 24th. Visit our website events page for ongoing updates for these two events and for other calendar edits as we go forward at lincolnpresidential.org. Finally, as you close out tonight's webinar, we thank you in advance for taking a moment to complete a quick survey. As always, thank you for joining us this evening and especially as we celebrate Lincoln's 215th birthday and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Good night.